you. I think the mic is working. And thank you to David for setting up this festival and to all the organizers. And most importantly, thank you for coming to my talk. So I'm Shazia Holtam. And currently, I'm leading the data science discipline at Pivotal. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard about Pivotal before, but those of you who have never heard about Pivotal, we are a Silicon Valley-based company that began in the 1990s with a simple idea of changing the way software is built. This idea was a little bit more iterative and a little bit more agile, and our current CEO, Rob Mee, was able to help companies like Google, Twitter, and eBay improve their software development cycle. Now, since then, since the success of that, Pivotal has grown quite a lot. In 2013, we uh, launched our digital transformation hub here in London. We also have offices in Dublin, Berlin, and more recently in Paris. Now, even though Pivotal has grown and it has changed quite considerably, one of our core offerings still remains the way we build software. More widely, these practices are known as extreme programming. And for those of you who are developers, you might have heard of these, this methodology. But it is very new uh, to data science. And today, I wanted to tell you about how we could use these tried and tested methods of extreme programming to put data science into production. But before I tell you about how to do things, Perhaps it's a good way of starting would be to discuss what it means to put data science into production. Um, for us at Pivotal, doing data science is all about driving actions. That's what our focus is on. So we take the data, of course, we apply a smart system, which is often a machine learning algorithm, and we wrap it up in a user interface that provides good user experience, and that is really important. And we, if we have this recipe right, we hope that this will drive the desired actions and have the desired impact that we're looking for. Now, you might be wondering why do this? Why think about driving actions? Why put data science into production? The reason for us is really Going back to a recent conference on AI, the head of data science at Lloyd's Banking Group had this really cool piece of advice for everyone doing data science, or thinking about using data science to advance their digital transformation. Don't strategize, experiment, is what he had to say. Now, I think that's a really good piece of advice. But I hope you'll agree that in order to experiment with data science, you need to get into a rapid build, measure, learn cycle. And you have to be able to do this cycle a number of times before you can get close to perfection with your idea. And in order to measure something and to learn from the impact, you have to answer this critical question. What is the impact of your data science model? Why did I put in all this hard work? What was the impact? And take, for instance, data visualization. Now, it's really good in helping users explore the data. But in order to understand what was the impact, <coughs> excuse me, what was the impact, it's a little bit more challenging to quantify that with a data visualization. In contrast, when you have your data science that is wrapped up and it's engineered to drive a desired action, in order to measure whether or not it had the desired impact becomes slightly easier. And really for those reasons at Pivotal, it's really important that we, when we do data science, it is in production and we think about the actions that we want it to drive. Let me illustrate this idea with an example. So on one of my recent projects was a collaboration with Pivotal and Sainsbury's. And um, for those of you who don't reside in the UK, Sainsbury's is one of our largest uh, supermarket chains. But Sainsbury's has recently launched a new service called Chop Chop. 
This is a fast grocery delivery app, and it promises to deliver up to 25 items in 60 minutes. And we used uh, data science to improve their search functionality. And it was a real privilege to work with the Chop Chop team. And we now call it the smart search in Chop Chop. So let me show you what that really means. So if you take a look at the screen, so today when you use the Chop Chop app, and say you search for something like pasta, these are the results that you'll get. The first item will be Sainsbury's mushroom tortellini. The second one is a ravioli and lasagna sheets and so on. Now you might have noticed that none of these products actually contain the word pasta in it, even though you searched for it. And that is the machine learning algorithm doing it. If we hadn't used machine learning to enhance the search, this is what it would have looked like. You type in pasta, it would return all the products that contain the word pasta in it. You might wonder why this is more relevant, why that this way is much better than the naive search. The reason why we went with this approach is because given past customer history, we know that when people search for something like pasta, what they end up buying is tortellini or ravioli. Uh, very few end up buying pasta salad. And for a convenience app, it was really important that we are able to extract the intent of the customer when they're searching and only show them the most relevant results. So let me tell you about how uh, we achieved this. So the algorithm behind this was based on uh, the contents of this chapter on result ranking by machine learning. And it can be found in this book, Introduction to Information Retrieval. And the idea behind <coughs> The idea behind uh, this algorithm is quite simple. Uh, we need three things. First of all, we need a training set, an example set of prejudged results. The second thing we need is a feature set of differences. And don't worry if this seems a little vague. I shall explain what these things mean in a little bit more detail in the coming slides. And the final thing that we need is a machine learning algorithm that will be able to tell us the right ordering from the incorrect ordering. So let's look at the first ingredient, the training set, which is an example set of prejudged results. What does that mean? That means we need a list of examples in which we know the ordering of the items. So if we want product A to appear before product B, we say, yes, that is the correct ordering. Give it a label plus one. If we don't want product C to appear before product A, we give it a minus one label. Yes? Uh, so for example, with the query pasta, you would have data that shows you examples of, say, tortellini versus tomato pasta. It would have a plus one label. Pairs where we don't like the ordering, it'll get a minus one label. Yeah? Simple? Any questions on the first ingredient, the training set? No? Good. Where did you get this from? Uh, from so Sainsbury's, of course, so it's been operating for a while. So we do have a historical customer data. And, and they know star pasta before tortellini is probably not a good idea. Yeah, for the query pasta, not a good idea. So that was really helpful. Uh, so what we had is a list of items that were bought and the number of times they were bought given a query like pasta. Once we have the list, we ordered it by, the num by its popularity and um, created the spares. So yes, yeah. but not perhaps as manually as typing it in. No. <laughs> but Yes. And that's where thinking about how to uh, do agile data science comes into um, implementation, but hopefully we'll talk about that in the second half. But yes, uh, we would do this for every query, build this training set. Once we have that, the second ingredient is the feature set of differences. And in order to get to the differences part, we need to start with the feature set. And what that means is that for every product, 
we will create a set of characteristics that will help us know what makes it relevant or irrelevant. So for product title A, we will measure the cosine similarity to the query, which is just a degree of similarity to the product title and the query. So it could be a perfect match, it could be perfect similarity with one or no match at zero. The second characteristics is the window width, which is how many letters of your query exists in your product title. Yes? So that could be a perfect match as well, so the length of the query or no match at all, so zero. So what the data would look like for pasta, you have, so the Sainsbury Sortolini, the product title is quite dissimilar to the query pasta. So it will have a near zero value. And it does not contain the word pasta, so the window width is zero. And tomato pasta salad, we have a higher similarity, so it is closer to one, and the word pasta is contained all five letters of it, so the window width is five. And that's how we create the feature set for all our products in our catalog. Once we have that, what we really want is the feature set of differences. So it's a simple subtraction between pairs of products, so feature set of product A minus feature set of product B. And the reason why we do this is because we're not interested in the individual products themselves. We're interested in their ordering. So we're interested in the pairs of products. So what we end up with is a feature set of differences, and the labels are from the training set. It's either a plus one or a minus one. Either we like the ordering or we don't like it. Yes? So any questions on this one? I'm great. Yes, I mean, that is a threshold that, again, you can play around with. Uh, for the first iteration, we went for either perfect match or not. So zero was included. But yes, the second iteration, we could improve it. So it'll be. This one? The before? Oh, it was based on just previous uh, customer history. So when, so for the Sainsbury's online shopping, we know that when people search for pasta, they end up buying tortellini. And we know that pasta, tomato pasta salad, is less frequently bought when people search for pasta. So we know the popularity, yeah, the historical data. I think it's the... Uh, again, for the first iteration, it did not make a difference. Um, so again, perhaps all these things will come into consideration when we talk about doing data science in an agile way. Yeah, perhaps we can talk about it. And that's a very good point because uh, we did end up adding to the product title. We ended up creating cosine similarity and window width for the description as well. So you can carry on doing that for as many pieces of information you have. I'm not sure I quite understand. So, you've got a difference uh, in the ordering to run the two variables, so traditional dry to dry. Yeah. If the search algorithm tells you what label to use to track pasta, it always return the same for any water drop. So, it puts the barrier to pasta first. Yes, I mean, that consistency is that of that. So, once the model is trained, you're right, because the equation will remain the same unless new pieces of information come up and in the creation of the training set. So if you said, if my examples were wrong, is that yeah, right? Historically, it was like pasta. Yeah. 
Sí. So this, because the data was coming from Sainsbury's um, online shopping, the assumption is again the central limit theorem that because they have large enough sample size that we are heading towards the truth. That when, if this was uh, just 10 people, uh, then I would question whether we got the information, the training set right in the first place. But um, thankfully, Sainsbury's has been going on for a while now. So uh, we had information of at least over um, like 50,000 examples of uh, purchases. So, but you're right, that is certainly the Achilles heel here. Or in any machine learning, uh, the training, it's only as good as the training set. So once we have that, that's when we can start having fun, really. Uh, we will use that feature set, the training set, to build a classifier that will tell us how to separate between relevant ordering versus irrelevant ordering. So the, uh, the pluses and the red crosses that you see on the screen represent pairs of uh, products. Yes? So a red cross is when the ordering of a pair is incorrect and a positive symbol is when the ordering of a pair is correct and we like it. So the challenge now is to find a hyperplane that will be able to separate between the wrong ordering and the correct ordering. And we know from a theory that the equation of the hyperplane is given by this. So W are the weights that we need to calculate, B is the bias or the intercept, and XI are the data points. We also know from theory that we have two additional hyperplanes, one nearer to the incorrect examples, and it has a value of minus one, and the other hyperplane, which has a positive value, but the rest of the equation remains the same. The other important concept here is knowing how to calculate the margin, which is the distance between these two hyperplanes. And for those of you who are interested in understanding how we come to these equations, there is a really good tutorial on this website, and I recommend <coughs> reading it. <coughs> but for right now, it's really important to know how we calculate the margin. Because what we really want to do is we want to find something that maximizes this margin. It maximizes the distance between our wrong examples and our right examples. And that is it. That's really the challenge here. And for those of you uh, who are well-versed in support vector machines, just a quick note to show you, there's a very slight difference in the rank support vector machine that we're using and our standard support vector machine. So uh, you recognize that we are maximizing the margin, and we need to, uh, the constraint here, or the condition that we need to meet is that the labels yi multiplied by the equation of the hyperplane needs to be greater than or equal to 1. The only difference with rank support vector machines is that instead of looking at individual data points, we're looking at pairs of products given a query. Yeah? And that is it. That's the only difference. Apart from that, you proceed as before. You look at the Lagrangian dual form and apply something like stochastic gradient descent to calculate the weights and the biases. So everything else remains the same. Yes? So just to recap, the data science side of things, it operates with a prejudged example list, which we call the training set. We calculate the feature set of differences. We feed it into a machine learning algorithm. For us, it was the rank support vector machine. And once we have trained the model, we can ask questions like, is product D more relevant than product D for a given a query? We still wanted a linear classifier, and we wanted something that would classify in terms of the pairs. Uh, again, in terms of whether we could have tried and applied other linear classifiers, it is perhaps something to be explored for iteration too. Again, coming back to, I will talk about this idea where in data science, we often try different models, and we evaluate different models, and how 
when we think about data science and production, we need a little shift in the way we practice data science. And uh, I should uh, tell you about it. Um, and yeah, in the next half, <laughs> let's talk about it. Oh, 10 minutes, okay, go. <laughs> So yes, let's talk about putting data science into production. So building a model and getting to a desired accuracy, as the gentleman in front pointed out, comparing, that is the easy part. That is something that data scientists have been doing for a while now. But the question is, how do I get this algorithm into the hands of my users? How do I put it into production? At Pivotal, we've used the principles of extreme programming. And I don't know if um, how many of you have heard of extreme programming, yes? Uh, so you'll know that it is a software development methodology. And the reason why it's called extreme is because it takes those ideas that have been beneficial to traditional software development to the extreme. And I'll just quickly tell you about four of these beneficial ideas that have been really helpful in getting our data science model into the hands of the user. First of all, the principle is how do we get to a shared understanding? A lot of times, or rather previously from my experience, is data science happens in a silo. I work on my laptop by myself, and the business side of the organization has little to no knowledge of what is happening until the final model or the final evaluation. And that is something that we found to be a hurdle when we want to put some data science into production. So why not get to a shared understanding right from the beginning? So every little task that I did during the data science piece of work had to provide some user value. And this guidance came entirely from the product team, from the business side of the organization. The second thing that we had was daily stand-ups and weekly retros, so everyone on the team knows what's happening. And the other tool that we used was the Pivotal Tracker. It's a way of logging all your tasks. And for those of you who use Trello, it is very similar to it. It just has a few advanced features. But it, this, all this together helped the business side of Chop Chop get an understanding of what the data science team was doing. The second principle that we used was test-driven development. This was to make sure that our data science code is robust. In this test-driven principle, or this test-driven way of writing software, each requirement is turned into specific test cases. So you will have unit tests that test the, the tiniest unit uh, individual units of behavior. You have integration tests that test the full process from start to finish. You have end-to-end -end tests that test the complete build of the app. So what does that look like very quickly? Unit test. You could, if you're writing a unit test, it would be test if the labels for my data points are either plus one or minus one. If you get a null or something that's greater than plus one, your test will fail. So that would be a basic unit test. Integration test. Make sure your data science code can do what it's supposed to do. Can it uh, read from the database correctly? Can it calculate the features? Can it train the model and produce the ranking for new queries? And then we think about end-to-end -end tests. Does your search ranking service or your data science service integrate with the rest of the app? Can it integrate in the bigger picture without breaking anything? Now, that's quite important. The third uh, process that we followed was continuous code review. So this happens, so this is a picture of our office, and you'll notice that people work in pairs. And this ensures that every piece of code that is written, there is a second pair of eyes to review it. Since we are a consultancy firm, we pair with our clients. So on the right-hand side, there's Omar, who is pairing with us every day, all day. Um, and fourth is continuous integration. This idea that as soon as we finish a task, we integrate with the whole system. This idea that as soon as we build a model and we are happy with a certain level of accuracy, which is, of course, that tolerance and that threshold for false positives, true, po no, well, true negatives, all that comes from the business side of the um, product. So for the data scientists amongst you, you will recognize this 
uh, traditional data science pipeline. So given a problem, you will start fleshing it out, what it is, look at the data, you start engineering, you start model building, you start evaluating the model, and once you are happy with different versions of the model and different types of, of uh, models, you think about putting it into production. You think about the operationalization of it. And then, hopefully, you'll collect some user feedback and you'll iterate. But you can see that if you start thinking about operationalization after model evaluation, at this stage, you already have quite a complex algorithm. You already have quite a complex solution to put into production. So when you come into operationalization, you're not only thinking about putting something complex into production, you're also thinking about how the wiring goes in place, how your data science piece of code fits into the bigger system. Now that is challenging to do everything at once. What we would recommend is once you have the problem fleshed out, think about how to operationalize it right from the get-go. For us, it was putting a very simple solution in place, which was given, say, a query pasta, it will uh, give you the, most, the cheapest pasta as the first item. So that's really simple. It's not machine learning, it's not data science, but we have the wiring in place. After that, proceed as before. Once you're happy with your algorithm, put it into production. Now you're only focused about putting a complex piece of code into production, and that just requires updating the production version. You're not worried about the wiring, and most importantly, if you start thinking about the wiring right at the beginning, you know that while there could be something, some other algorithms that are sophisticated, but you, but they would not or might not work in production because you need to have it producing results real time. You cannot expect a long delay in code. Or you might have to rethink how your results are surfaced. You might have to retrain your model every, say, every once a week on mid, at midnight or something like that. So you start getting an understanding of how, what the limits are when you put your algorithm into production. So for the sake of completion, this is what the deployment architecture looked like. We have the ChopChop Chop app that interfaces with an API that does much of the um, work. It interacts, the API interacts with the search ranking service. It's built as an entirely separate service so that if it goes down, nothing else breaks in the app. And all of these services or microservices are hosted in Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And the tools that we've used is, uh, for this project, we've used Python, um, Jenkins for continuous integration, GitHub for version control, Pivotal Tracker, and Jupyter. Now, really, it brings me back to the main question of putting, doing this hard work, putting data science into production. What was the impact? Can we learn from it? Is there a need to go and update the model? Is there a need to do something different? First of all, we found that by putting a machine learning model, it outperformed the naive uh, Postgres search. This took us two and a half months to go from exploration to uh, deployment. And after deployment, in three months, we noticed that there was an average increase of 4% in ads to basket from search. Now this, for a fledgling service like Chop Chop, was quite an improvement, and so that was really great news for data science in production. But of course the iteration and improvement carries on, so this uh, model will retrain with every new piece of information, it will retrain once a week at midnight on a Friday. <laughs> and it will update its weights, and so the equations will, or the values for the equations will change. So, to quickly conclude, I take it I've run out of time anyways. <laughs> so if you're doing data science, I would certainly recommend, think about the build, measure, learn cycle. Think about how, before investing a lot of time and building the most perfect model, think about the impact and how you're going to measure it, how are you going to quantify, and how are you going to get to a better product. That requires us to do 
data science in an agile way. It certainly requires us to think slightly differently instead of starting right at the beginning with the most sophisticated, most complicated solution. It requires us to take a step back and think about, is this just cool to do or does it really provide user value? And once you have something in production, iterate and then iterate again. Well, thank you for listening. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions. And Uh, how do you fit A-B testing into the, the cycle? So when you, you, know, you want to prove that the model is, is better rather than looking at... Um, yes, that, um, that the A-B testing side of things, we've been thinking about that a lot recently because it's such a critical part of the build, measure, learn cycle. We are torn between having that as part of the data science pipeline versus having that as a part of the product management pipeline. And right now, it sits with the product management pipeline only because, A, there, is already, there are good tools out there that we can purchase and do the A-B testing. The, of course, and there are things that we have to worry about looking at it too soon and all the other of ways of A-B testing, but it is a good start. Um, whether that will be integrated in the data science pipeline, probably not. It's How many people were working, were working on this uh, project? Um, was it like one project manager once a week and then three guys full time, or just to get an idea of, of time oh. and resource and price? Yes. So uh, it is still a two pizza team. It's still a very small team, so uh, we had one product manager, but as I've shown you, we work in pairs. So one product manager from Pivotal, one product manager from the client side. Uh, one data scientist from Pivotal, one data scientist from the client side. We will work in pairs so that when the client, when the client goes away, you go away with all the intellectual property, you're able to iterate on it yourself without needing to come back to us, and that is really important, so. Yes. And more, actually, we have uh, developers and we have designers as well in the team. So about five, we were five people on the team and five from Pivotal and five from the client side. All five are full-time? Full-time, all, yes, yes. It requires the business side of the team also to be there to answer our questions on a daily basis. Yeah. Hi. Um, could you describe a little bit more about the, the paired coding approach? Are the two people sat at the same machine or next to one another? Or, and how it do is. they actually review each other's code? So uh, this one. If you can see, they are, uh, they are two screens. but. Uh, we are all working on the same problem. So the two people are working on exactly the same problem, looking at exactly the same code. For part of the session, one person will drive the code, and the other person will be in charge of reviewing it or critiquing it. And then you'll switch the driving. So the, perhaps the next 20 minutes, the second person will drive and write the code. And the idea is, well, so that everyone on the team has context. And the pairs are switching every day. So we have people rotating around different tasks. And the idea is really that if, say, I were to walk away from Pivotal, they can carry on without me holding them hostage to my code. And it's a lot easier with the handover. So, yeah, that's. Uh, following the, this pair uh, coding, do you all do that the entire day? Yes. Painful. It is, uh, yeah, you're yeah, right. It is, uh, the first time I tried it, it is taxing, no doubt. But once you get into the swing of things, this idea of, um, well, discussing your method before implementing it, I have to say, Honestly, it has made my code a lot better. I would have probably wasted more time if I was on my own and trying all sorts of different ideas without thinking it through. So yes, it takes a while to get used to. Uh, uh, 
if there's if there's search for your for the product which you find there's a nearly no similarity or no no similar product in your system how's your model dealing this type of issue or challenge see you just mentioned that your svn has cutting by the hyperplane if if there's no vector around the hyperplane or it's very little chance found there's how 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 your model dealing with this type Wait. type of challenge so if i've understood the question right it is what happens if the model res returns no results is that uh, it's it's why I ask is if 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 you t if there's search or type, there's your model found that there's pretty much no similarity of the product. You that return finds how? no similarity. Yes, of course. Uh, that is again when you're thinking about putting data science into production, we think about what happens in those extreme cases when there's a failure or there is a there is no similarity, or the data science uh, code breaks for some reason the default is to revert back to the Postgres naive search. So it will do a simple match of the query against the product titles. Yeah. So thinking about those scenarios as well. Hi. Uh, how did you deal with monitoring the model performance while it is in production? So uh, again, monitoring the model's performance was really done by the add to basket. We wanted to make sure that it doesn't get any worse than before. That was our control, really. But to our surprise, uh, I guess pleasant surprise, that it did increase for the queries that we've implemented it for. Uh, and again, going back to, I think there was a question around there, was you have to, when you have to build this model for every possible query, again, Trying to do this at one go is very difficult. So the agile side of things was to break it down to the top most frequently searched queries. So right now, we've implemented it for milk, pasta, chicken, and I think bread is also in there, instead of looking at the whole spectrum and the whole possibility. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so it's being monitored by the product team. In terms of classification accuracy, of course, we have, it spits out uh, every Friday when it retrains, it spits out the accuracy level. But uh, we don't have, I don't think anyone is specifically monitoring it every Friday unless we go back and look at it um, uh, and decide to stop the service. That's a bit, a bit you good? Good, run out of time. Um. Uh, thank you. But yeah, please do find me if you have any more questions and come visit us at Pivotal if you're interested. <laughs>